Well, um, I'm going to ask uh, my buddy here, Micah, if he'll help me out with a few jokes this morning. You can't have a good joke without a good little drum beat after, you know, that kind of thing. And I thought I could kind of do that for you, but how much better when you have a live drummer do that, right? Yeah. So this morning, the title of my message is Roar with the Heart of a Servant. Roar with the Heart of a Servant. How many of you know we rule with the heart of a servant, we serve with the heart of a king? Amen. We rule with the heart of a servant and we serve with the heart of a king. And so um, this morning, I got a few jokes for you, and you know, I'd appreciate even if you just humor me and maybe laugh a little at them. I know they're not great. Thank you. What a great start. Awesome. Okay, how about this one for you? I got a question for you. What do you call a chicken crossing the road? Poultry in motion. Thank you. Come on. Get it? Yeah. Wait for it. Poultry in motion. Get it? Good. All right. Hey, what do you call a boomerang that doesn't work? A stick. stick. Boom. Got it. (laughs) Nice job. What do you call four Spanish bullfighters in quicksand? (laughs) Cuatro cinco. (laughs) Thank you. Where do you find a dog with no legs? Right where you left them. <laughs> Come on, that's, that's a good joke right there. Sorry. I know I'm going to get a call from the ASPA or PC or later. Right, I love this one. What do you call cheese that isn't yours? Nacho it's nacho cheese. cheese, man. It's nacho cheese. <laughs> love that one. What do you call a man who falls into an upholstery machine after a little while? He is fully recovered. (laughs) All right, now, for my last one here, what do you call a Christian who isn't serving? A contradiction. Where's the applause? Where's the laugh? Come on, guys. I know, ouchie, right? Oh, ha, ko, on my head. That one hurts a little, doesn't it? (laughs) Oh, what do you call a Christian who isn't serving? It's a contradiction because it's Jesus' heart that he came not to be served but to serve. And if we're going to be like him, he's called us to be servants, to follow him. He came and he gave us an example. The life that he lived, he lived as a servant. Do you know the word definition of a Christian is to be Christ-like. It's actually to be little Christ. And if we're going to be and call ourselves Christians, there's no way that we can call ourselves Christians without having the heart of a servant, without serving. It just doesn't go together. It's like peanut butter without the jelly or the stuffing without the Oreo, although some of you might like that stuffing without the Oreo. I don't know. But it just doesn't work. Micah, can we give it up for Micah? Thanks, Micah. Thanks for helping me out this morning. I really appreciate it. You know, we are most like Jesus when we serve. And, you know, last week we talked about all of me for all of him. That was the title of the message. And there's no way that we can roar, so to speak, without having all of him in our life. And I, I want to remind you guys of the definition of, of roar as we've gone through this series, what it means to roar. What it means to roar is this. God is at work in us in order to work through us. And when we allow him to work through us, we roar. Say it one more time. God is at work in us in order to work through us. When we allow him to work through us, we roar. Are you guys ready to roar? Let me hear one. Let me hear a good roar. Ah, I love it. That was pretty good. Not too bad. Yeah, that's good stuff. The last couple weeks we've been talking about, we started out this series talking about what Jesus did on the cross, what he accomplished when he gave his life up. And not only when he died, but when he resurrected, the resurrection life and the power that came out of the grave, how he defeated darkness, he defeated death, he defeated sin, and he triumphed over it. He triumphed over death. And he went, he gave his life as a ransom, as the, as the lamb, And he came out of the grave as the triumphant Lion of Judah, roaring. And now, when we invite him to come into our hearts and into our lives, when we accept him, when we make him Lord of our lives, 
Now he lives inside of us. We have the king of kings inside of you this morning. Do you know that? Do you really know it? Do you know what that means? That means that you can roar. That means that there is nothing in this world that can stop you from knowing Christ, from living in the life that he's called you to. How many of you know this morning you are here for a specific reason? You were placed here for this time for a purpose. And we're going to talk about that more later. But, you know, I was thinking about this whole message, and I was really um, thinking about what, the, what is the crux of it. The bottom line is this. All of us are going to spend our life on something. All of you, right now, you're spending your life on something. All of us in this room have three things. I'm going to talk about those three things. The first one is this. The first one is time. I wear a watch. I love watches. It's one of the things I like actually collect. My wife gives me um, nice watches, and I like them. My favorite watches are fossils. I don't know how many fans are those, but they make really cool watches that are really good quality and are not very expensive. They should pay me for this stuff, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> time. In my office, I have a clock. When I'm sitting in there, when I'm preparing, I hear tick, 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 tick. It's a constant reminder to me that time is ticking by. Time is going by. Right here, right now, this morning, time is going by us. You can't get back yesterday. You can't get back last week. You can't get back last month. You can't get back last year. It's gone. It's done. Time continues to move on. Time is one of the greatest assets, if not the greatest asset that you have. You're here. You're alive. You're breathing. You're alive for a purpose. You're here at this moment for a reason. It's because God wants to use you. He saved you for a purpose. Amen. And you have time is a valuable asset. The second one is this. Your treasure. Your treasure. The Bible says, and Jesus said, where your heart is, or where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. So what do you treasure this morning? What are the things that you treasure? Because what you treasure determines how you use your time, how you use your resources. You know, if you want to know if somebody's all in with Jesus, one of the easiest things to do is take a look at the ledger in his checkbook or look at his bank statement. You can tell what somebody values by what they spend their treasure on. You can tell what somebody values by how they spend their time. And the last one is this, and I had to use the greatest baseball team, you know, ever as this example, the New York Yankees. Yes, yes come on, Yankee fans, yeah, you guys are going to get converted. Yeah. <laughs> Notice that it says World Series right here, um, 27 championships. I don't really have to say any more, do I? But this represents talent. This represents talents. Hey, come on, it does. I mean, yeah, I don't care if they have to spend 200 million. It still represents talent, right? It represents talent. Every single one of you here sitting here this morning, you have a talent. You have a gift that God has given you. Now, I, you may think to be sitting there, well, I'm not very talented. I can guarantee you that if we sat down, you and I could talk, we could find something that you're talented in, that you're gifted in, that God has gifted you in, that you are uniquely talented. I've, I've met some amazingly gifted, talented people over the course of my life, and it never ceases to amaze me. People that you would overlook, and you get with them, and you find out they have this amazing talent that they're not using. You ever meet somebody like that? You're like, you, you, the more you get to know them, you find out, wow, you're really brilliant in this area. You're really gifted in this area. Did you know that? Well, yeah, you know, kind of. Talents. We all have talents. Now, I bet some of you are like amazing kazoo players, you know? <laughs> like you can play the kazoo like nobody's business. I mean, you can play some rap songs on there. You can play anything. Mary Had a Little Lamb. There's some of you that are brilliant architects. There's some of you that have amazing minds. You can crunch numbers. You can compute things in your mind and spit them out just like that. That's not my gift, I can tell you that. But for some of you, it is. Some of you are amazing athletes. 
You can do things that nobody else can do. I got a friend who can sit on the, or stand on, on the concrete, and he can literally jump into the back of a pickup truck with the tailgate up. Boom, just like a frog, man. It's amazing. <laughs> people are amazing. God created people with amazing gifts, amazing talents. But God has given you three things. Your time, your treasure, your talents. He hasn't given them just for your pleasure. That's a part of it. But he's given those things to you for you to use them. For to use them for his glory. For you to use them to roar. For you to use them to change this world that we live in. To bring hope to this world in the dark places. To be light in darkness. To be salt to this world. To be a city on a hill. That other people would look and say, what is it about these people? There's something different about them. They don't just use the typical things that most people in this world use for their own gain, for their own personal comforts, for their own personal securities, for their own personal promotion. They're actually using the things, their talents, their time, their treasure for the things of God. They're investing them in people. This morning, I want to talk to you about investing your time, your talents, and your treasures in the things of God, how we serve him, how you can be of service to God. If we're going to roar, church, if we're going to roar, we need to have a heart of a servant. We need to roar with the heart of a servant. Amen? Amen. Let's look at the scripture out of Matthew chapter 6. In verse 24, it says this, No one can serve two masters. For you're either going to hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, typically you read this verse, you think this is about money, right? And of course, there is an element to this that is about money. But that word wealth is actually the word mammon. Now, kind of a a creepy word, mammon, what what is that all about? Um, So I looked it up. I want to give you a little bit of a definition of what mammon is. And I want you to think about this in this context. So many of us, we want to follow Christ. And we do to a certain measure. But there's another part of us that our lives are divided. See, we have a tendency as human beings to compartmentalize our life into different categories. I have my church life here, this little box. I have my work life over here in this little box. I have my, my family life over here. And then, and then there's the me box over here. These are, this is my little private space. Nobody can enter over here. We compartmentalize into these different categories. Even when we create to-do lists, we create to-do lists based on the different categories. And I think it's important. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, I don't want any line. I, I Actually, he's saying, I'm sorry, he does want a line. He wants to, he's drawing a line here and saying, you can't serve both the world and yourself and me. It's impossible. You have to make a decision. You have to decide. You have to, like we talked about last week, all of us in this room, you're going to be confronted with God just like Jacob. And God is drawing a line and he's saying, where are you at? Just like he did to Adam in the garden. He said, where are you? He's asking you, where are you? Have you had your all-in moment? Your all-in moment where you said, there there was a moment I was all in. You know, we were in worship this morning, and we are singing that song, Oceans, and it wrecks me. Why does it wreck me? It wrecks me because I remember the day in this church on a Sunday morning just like this, where I knew I had a decision to make if I was going to leave my job and become your pastor of this church. And that song was played, and I got down on my knees right over there in this church. It was an all-in moment for me. It was a moment I wept, and I said, God, if this is you, if this is what you have for me, I'll give everything up for it. I'll do it because I love you, and I know that your call on my life is greater than anything I could ever experience otherwise. So not my will, but yours be done. It was my all-in moment. That moment, I went all in. Every time I hear that song, it's a reminder to me of the day that I said, I am all in. 
every one of you here, you have to have that moment. You gotta know, you gotta be able to say on that date, I said, I'm going all in. I'm putting all my chips on the table, I'm giving you everything I got, and I'm not holding back. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. He's drawing a line in the sand and he's saying, you know what? You can't serve me and serve yourself. You can't serve me and you can't serve the world. You can't serve me and serve your job. You can't serve me and serve your personal preferences. You can't serve me and do whatever you want to do. You can't do it. So what does this word mammon mean? It's anything in which we might trust instead of God. Mammon is really anything this world offers apart from God. In other words, mammon is the temporal. And see, so I think there's this element that we could get so caught up, people. Listen, this is important. Time is ticking. Time is wasting away. What are we doing with our lives? I gave my life to Christ over 20 years ago. I gave my life again because of the call that he had on my life. Because I wasn't satisfied with just going to job and making good money and living life and having fun and enjoying my life. I wanted all that he had for me. I want all that he has for me. I want all that he has for this church. I want all that he has for you. I want it all. I don't want it in part. If you want it in part, you get it in part. What you want is what you get. If you want all of him, it's going to take all of you. And Jesus is saying here, right here, you can't, you can't love me and still trust in other things. You can't trust that your job is going to be there next week and you're putting your faith and your trust in that and you're making decisions based off of that. You can't put your trust in even your relationship with your wife, your spouse, your husband, you can't put your, your trust in any of those things. You can't put your trust in the stock market. You can't put your trust in the economy of this valley. The only thing that you could put your trust in is Jesus. He's the only one that doesn't disappoint. Now, that doesn't mean you may find yourself in a place where you've lost your job, you've lost your wife, you've lost your kids, and, and your dog got run over. Sounds like an awesome country song, <laughs> right? Doesn't mean your life is gonna be perfect without challenges, without real challenges, without real problems, without real difficulties. These are real things we go through. Being a Christian doesn't shelter you from those things. What it guarantees you is that he will be with you. I love what David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? Because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You are with me. You grab me by my right hand. That means no matter what you're going through this morning, no matter where you find your circumstances, as long as you're holding on to Jesus, you got everything you need. You got everything you need to get through it victorious. But we can get so caught up in our lives right here, right now, that we forget we are called to live for eternity. We're not just living for today. Do you know that Everything you do today, how you invest your time, how you invest your treasure, how you invest your talents, you're sowing seeds into the future. You're sowing seeds. And they're either going to bear good fruit or they're going to bear no fruit or they're going to bear bad fruit. The seeds that you sow today are determined what the outcome is in your life tomorrow. So how are you investing? How are you investing your time your treasure, your talents. Jesus is challenging you this morning. He's challenging me. Choose this day whom you will serve. Look at this next scripture. Out of John chapter 12, verses 24 through 26, it says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's the good fruit. That's what we want. Verse 25, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, this is the key here, if anyone serves me, this is Jesus speaking to you and me this morning, he must follow me. He must be like me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. And the Father will honor him. 
So what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is calling us up to a higher place. He's saying that if you want to follow me, you have to die to yourself. You can't serve yourself. You can't take the things that you've been given, your time, your talents, and treasures. That's your seed. You can't take your seed and plant it in other places, in places that you can get your own fulfillment, places in the world, places all over. There's tons of places you could spend those things, right? We all do it. Every day you get up, I guarantee you, you're spending them, you're sowing your seed into something. The question is, what are you gonna sow it into that's gonna make an impact for eternity? That's the real question. If we're gonna be followers of Jesus, Anyone who serves me must follow me. Who are we following? We're following the one that came not to be served, but to serve. We came for the one who, on the night that he was betrayed, to me this is the most beautiful picture, and it really sums up the life of Jesus. On the very night that he was betrayed, he gathered his disciples in an upper room. And what did he do? He took up a servant's cloth, and he wrapped it around his waist. He got down on his hands and knees, his hands and knees, and he washed each one of those disciples' dirty, stinking feet. How many in here this morning, and you've been walking in stuff that doesn't smell good? You've been walking in places you know you shouldn't be walking. You've been walking in dirt, you've been walking in muck, you've been walking in mire. Let me tell you back then, they didn't have closed toe sandals, okay? This was not a pretty thing. In fact, it was an extremely humbling thing. In, in um, Jewish culture, the lowest ranking servant was the one that was tasked with washing people's feet. It was dishonorable when you came into a house that you didn't take off your sandals. That was the custom. When you came in, that was the first thing you did. You took your sandals off. And the lowest ranking servant, not just any servant, the lowest ranking servant was the one tasked to wash those people's feet. And it was very dishonorable if you didn't wash your guests' feet. Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, he took a towel and he went around to each of his disciples, the ones that he was teaching, feet, and he washed them one by one. Now, back in that day, you can imagine how dirty, stinky, nasty these feet were. When they, they walked on dirt roads, they, uh, the camels, donkeys, they all shared the same road. You get the picture here. Not pretty, not smelling good, not looking good. It was a, a really gross job. One of the lowest things that you could do, and Jesus got on his knees and did it. This is the king of kings that we follow. This is the Lord that we're following this morning. He did it as an example to show the disciples. And even then, there was arguments that broke out at the table. Who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who would sit at his right hand? And he said, guys, it's not about that. You're missing the whole point. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. If we're going to follow him, we need to have the heart of a servant. If we're going to roar, we got to serve with the heart of a king. Amen? Amen. There's three things, three C's to servanthood. First one is this. You were created to serve. You were created to serve. When God created man, he created us to serve. If you go back and look at Genesis, the book of beginnings, why did he create humans? He created us to have rule and have authority. But even... Jesus said, the greatest shall be the least, and the least the greatest. Those who have the most authority are the ones who serve. I'll say that again. Those who have the most authority in the kingdom of God, not here in this earth, those aren't the rules that we play by here in good old America, but in God's economy, those who have the greatest authority are the ones that serve. We were created to serve. Look at this verse out of Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. I love that, don't you? Do you know that you're sitting here this morning as God's masterpiece? He is creating a beautiful picture with your life if you let him. But you ever notice when somebody's painting, the paintbrush and the paint, it doesn't push back on the painter. Otherwise, it may not look pretty. 
What does it do? It yields itself into the painter's hand. I think about the potter making beautiful pieces of clay. The Bible talks about how we are clay in the hands of the potter. The clay doesn't fight back. It doesn't say, no, I don't want to be this. I want to be this. It doesn't do that. You're God's masterpiece. The only way that you're going to be this beautiful picture that people can look at and look at your life as a canvas and say, that's beautiful. There is something beautiful about that. It's a beautiful life. Why is it a beautiful life? Because you are God's masterpiece. But the only way that you're going to be God's masterpiece, if you will let him use you, if you'll let him take the brush, dip it in the paint that he wants to paint, and create a beautiful picture with your life. You're God's masterpiece. He has created you, us, anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Do you know that before you were even born, God says he knew you in your womb. He already planned for you the good works that you would do. What are those good works? Those good works are serving. Those good works are the things that you would do with your time, your talents, your treasure to serve God and to serve people. What? When, the, when they tried to trip Jesus up, they asked him, what are the greatest commandments? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and serve him alone. Serve him. Our first call is to serve him alone. What's our second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. Boom. Right there. Serve God. Serve men. It also says that Jesus, and if Jesus had to do this, how much more we? It says, the Bible says that Jesus grew in favor and stature with God and with man. How did he grow in favor with God? How did he grow in stature with people? He did it by serving. He did it by serving. He realized God's heart for us. His heart is to serve. What, what, what does the Bible say? God, God, the creator of the universe. Get this, people, this morning. The creator of the universe, John 3, 16, he gave, he gave his only son. Why? Because he so loved you. He gave, that's serving. The creator of the universe served you by giving you his son, his one only son, Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Jesus did the same thing. What he saw the father do, he did. He says he only did what he saw the Father doing. What did he see the Father do? He saw the Father give. And because he saw the Father give, he gave his life freely. Freely to you and me. You were created to serve. The second C is this. You're called to serve. You are called to serve. God has called each and every one of you to serve. Do you know that in the, in the Greek, in the Bible, the word service and ministry Go to, they're the same. It's the same word. It goes together. Service and ministry. Do you know that each one of you sitting here, you have a ministry? Amen. You are called to service, which means you're called to have a ministry. Yeah. Right. You're called to serve. There is a ministry birthed inside you. There are seeds planted in your spirit a long time ago. There are things that I want to ask you this morning. What makes you come alive? What makes you come alive? What are the things that you do that make you come alive. When you do them, you come alive. There's something inside you that gets excited. There's something inside of you that it connects with, and this brings me life. We weren't created to be the Dead Sea people. We have Jesus Christ inside of us. What are we gonna do? Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this treasure. You have a treasure inside of you. Do you get that? The king of all the universe is inside your heart. He's inside your spirit this morning. You have this treasure in an earthen vessel. What are you going to do with that treasure? Are you going to bury it? Are you going to hide it? Are you going to invest it? Are you going to take that treasure and you're going to share it with the world? Are you going to invest it in people? Are you going to invest it in lives? You have a ministry. Yes. You have a ministry this morning. You are called to serve. You're called because you have a ministry. You, every one of you here, there is something inside of you that you love doing. We weren't created to just come together, have a great time in God. That's awesome. I love it. I love Sunday mornings. But this is to equip us to go outside this place and let the life of Jesus pour out of us. This is the place where we get filled up. 
This is the place where we get our tanks filled so we can go out and we can pour it out. We could give to people who are broken down on the side of the road, so to speak, with their life because they ran out of gas. Well, guess what? You got the pump to fill them up. If you have Jesus flowing through your bones this morning and your blood, you've got the life of Christ. You've got that pump to give them fuel, to give them life, to recharge them. You've got hope inside of you because you have Jesus. You have a ministry. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. This is a high calling, people. This isn't a calling to do something great here on the earth. I know that's what the world tells us to do. Unless we make an impact here in a, a material sense, we're, we're successful in our job. We're successful in these things, and those things are good. But they're not our life. They're not our life. Our life is in Christ. Our life is to have the life of Christ alive in us so that we can give life through service, through serving. The churches that I see making the most impact in people's lives are the ones that have the most servants. They have servants who are, they are diehard men. They are giving themselves to the church. They are all in. If you're happy coming to church and having a good time, God bless you. You're welcome to come here. But this is going to be a church that makes an impact in this valley. I didn't give my life to just come to church week after week and do the same thing over and over. I came to make a difference. I came to see lives changed. I came to see lives transformed by the power of God. I came to see people broken from addiction, broken over bondage, marriages restored, life. I came to see life happen. Yes. Why are you here this morning? Are you here to hear another good message, to hear another good word? Or are you here to lay down your life for the King of Kings so that he can work through you? His life can filter through you. It can flow out of you. You see that up there? That's a prophetic stained glass picture. What is it? It's a river. This house has been called to be a river of life, a river of compassion, a river of restoration, a river of healing, a river of deliverance. That will be this house. Amen. I declare it in the name of Jesus today. The question is, is, do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to be a part of what God is doing on the earth? Because he hasn't stopped doing things, people. Let me tell you, the Bible is real. But God has not stopped doing the miraculous. He has not stopped doing the supernatural. People's lives are still changed. They're still impacted. The Holy Spirit is still moving and breathing and having its way. But it's looking for a people who are completely yielded, who are sold out, that are all in. All chips are on the table and says, I am here. Use me. Use me. The last C is this. You are commanded to serve. It, Jesus isn't just asking you, if you're going to follow me, would you please consider maybe serving? You know, I'd like you to think about that a little bit and, and maybe um, get back to me after you've had a little bit of time and let me know. No, it's very clear. He's saying this morning, if you're going to follow me, you have to serve. There's no choice in this matter. And you know, I understand we are all on a spiritual journey. There's some of you that are sitting here this morning and you might say, you know what, Lance? I'm not ready to make that kind of commitment. I'm not ready to go all in. But I, I am willing to maybe take the next step. You know what? That's all God is asking of you this morning. If that's all you can do, he'll take it. If maybe you're here and you say, I'm not, I'm not willing to give it all up, but, but I'll, 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 I'll give up something. I'll take that next step. I'll do whatever God is calling me to. That's all he's asking you to do. 1 Peter 4.10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. That's a commandment. This is Paul speaking, but I believe it. it's the inspired word of God. Not just for back then, but for us today. God has given each one of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Every one of you in here has a spiritual gift. Use them well to serve one another. Amen?
Amen. We're going to transition into um, a time here. You notice that I told you guys I would tell you what uh, these balloons are all about. And, um, and I plan to fulfill my obligation and what I said to you. So this morning we're calling it Hope in Action Sunday. Hope in Action Sunday, a couple of weeks ago, we had a vote as a church. We voted on our new mission, our new vision statement, and a new name. God is doing something new in New Covenant Church. And I'm excited about it. You're here this morning. I want to ask you to join with me. As your pastor, I'm asking you to join with me to put hope in action. And so this morning, I want to um, share with you and remind you of a couple. Maybe you weren't here, but we're going to skip this for the sake of time. We're going to go to our new mission statement. Our new mission statement is this. It's to renew lives through the hope in Jesus. To renew lives through the hope of Jesus. It's all about seeing lives changed. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. That's our mission. It's about seeing lives changed. If we gather together Sunday after Sunday and we're not changing, something's wrong. Something's not right. We are here to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ so that a lost and dying world without hope can see that there is hope for them. Why? Because they see it in somebody else. They see that there's hope in you. What were you before? Now, you've got a story. You've got a testimony. You've got something to give. You've got something to share with somebody to give them hope because hope is alive in you. We sang this morning, hope is rising. You know what? I feel it in my bones. Hope is rising. So our mission statement, to renew, it means to make something new, fresh, or strong again, to make a promise, a vow again, to begin something, especially with more force or enthusiasm. Are you ready to start something new with force and enthusiasm? I feel like God is. And our vision statement is this. It's the four R's, I call them. Our vision is to build a Jesus-centered church that reaches people, restores hope, renews lives, and releases purpose. Right there. Simple, but yet powerful. The beauty of this vision statement is, not only is it our vision, but it is our process. How do we reach our mission of seeing lives renewed through the hope in Jesus? We do it. It starts by reaching people. We have to go outside of the four walls of this church. Amen. We can't expect to people just to say, oh, I'm going to get up today. I think I'm going to go to church, and I think I'm going to go to New Covenant Church. How many of you are sitting here because you had that revelation one day? Like, I think I just need to go to church today. I was at the bar last night. I'm still hungover, but gee, I think it'd be nice to go to church. No, I'm driving here this morning at 7 a.m. and I see this dude walking with a beer chalada can in his hand and I'm thinking, wow, man, I should probably pick that dude up to go to church. He'd probably look at me like, huh, whatever, dude, you know, I'm chilling on my Sunday. Who does that? Nobody does. It's our call. It's our assignment to reach people. Jesus said, go into all the world. Start in Jerusalem. Jerusalem represents your home base, your home right here. Samaria, a little bit outer, the valley, maybe Kalispell, the valley, maybe it's the U.S., and to all the ends of the earth. This is going to be a church that always is mission-minded. We love our missionaries. We will always send out missionaries. We love it, sending people out into all the ends of the earth. But we also have a call. I believe in the local church. I believe that it's God's greatest weapon to attack the enemy, to tear down the gates of hell, and to see the power of heaven released on the earth. I believe that with all my heart. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this. Okay? Now, I'm going to play a video for you, and, um, and then I'm going to tell you, like I promised, about these tables. Okay? So cue up the video, guys. So are you ready to answer God's call to go? He's calling you this morning. As I'm closing, I want to share with you something <clears throat> David gave me. This is a picture of me from 2007. I was a teacher in kids' church. I came to this church, I think it was around 2004, five maybe, somewhere around there. I sat just where you sat. I knew the minute I walked through those doors, God called me to be part of this house. No doubt about it. 
but I sat just where you did until one day I heard a call from this pulpit that there was a need for helpers in kids' ministry by David Halliburton. I answered that call that morning, and I signed my name up. I taught kids' church. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Taught kids' church for years. I grew in this house. I grew in serving. I grew in my quote-unquote ministry. There came to a point, a season, I was a leader in kids' church. Then, after a while of doing that, I felt like God was doing something new. He was doing something different. We didn't really have a men's ministry that was thriving in this church. And as my heart grew um, for men, I felt like God calling me to step into that and take on that role. And so I came to the leadership and said, hey, I'd like to do this. Would you consider it? And they did. And they, they anointed me the men's ministry leader. I became the men's ministry leader of this house, served in men's ministry, leading men for a while. After a while, we, we, we became life group leaders, my wife and I. We led a life group for five years. Our, some of our best friends, you're sitting here this morning, you were part of that life group. We did life together. We saw God move. We're seeing our kids grow up together. Forgive me. We became community pastors because we were asked by our pastor. We stepped into that role. All the while, I was a businessman traveling all over, sales, working hard, raising a family with my wife, five kids, giving to the church. I'm here, right, standing right here because of that, because I said yes. I'll give. I'll go. I'll do it. God's here this morning. He's asking you the same thing. What are you willing to do to see the life of God come into people's lives right here, right now, this place, this time, this season? That's the question. So this morning, I want to challenge you as your pastor on a couple of things. Do we have one of those hope brochures? Can somebody run one up to me, please, real quick? Marvin, you're like a cheetah, man. You are fast. <laughs> Today's Hope in Action Sunday. It's the day that we can put hope in action. It's the calling of this church. All across and around this sanctuary, you'll see tables with different colors. Now, we're going to pass out, you guys go ahead and pass these out. We're going to pass out these. You can put the slide up um, for the different teams here. There's a little book that we put together. It's called Building a Vision, Hope Teams. Now, it's got um, a little logo here that our leadership really likes. It's not final yet, but we like your feedback on it as well. But in this booklet, you'll see on the front page is our mission and our vision as a church. Our mission and our vision guides everything that we do. Every decision that we make as a leadership, what, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, is guided by this mission and this vision. And so we want you guys to get a hold of this mission and vision with us. This isn't about us. It's about us. We are the church. We are the church. This mission and vision will be mission impossible without you. It will be mission impossible without you. You play a significant role. And so we've listed inside this booklet all the different ministries in our church with a brief description about each one. We want you, I want to ask you this morning, and we're going to um, break here in just a minute, we're going to have representatives of each of these tables. If God is stirring something in you, if there's something inside of you, that seed that would stir inside of you that say, yeah, I have a heart for prayer. Well, we have a team for you. We have a ministry for you here in this church for prayer. If you have a heart for young people, you want to see God come in the lives of young people in their teens, we have a ministry for you. If you love kids, if you want to have a great time, I can tell you it's a blast working with kids. This is a plug for you, buddy. You can pay me back later for that one. Kids is a blast. It's so much fun working with kids. Sowing into lives. They're, hey, listen, there's some kids. There's some parents that drop kids off here and then they leave. They're not walking with God. They don't know God. But there's something instinctual inside them that knows they want something better for their kids. You have an a, a awesome opportunity to impact kids, not only kids' life, but a family's life. 
Why are we doing all those things? We're not doing all these things in this book to build the church. We're doing all these things to build people. We're doing all these things to make an impact in people's lives, to see lives renewed, to see lives changed through the hope that we have in Jesus. That's our mission. That's why we do this. For our greeters, our greeters, you think our greeters come just because, you know, they just love saying hi to 300 people shaking their hands? Some of them do. That's awesome. I love you for that. But they come because they have a servant heart, because they understand that when they come and they shake somebody's hand and they look them in the eye, they don't know where those people have been, where they were yesterday. They don't know what they're going through. And they're giving them hope by the way they greet them. That's why we do this. It's not just to do church and, and all that stuff. There's a why behind it. And the why is to see lives renewed through the hope in Jesus. So I'm going to dismiss you guys here in just a minute. And I want to ask before you pick up your kids, you look at these different ministries, you consider, you put it before God, you say, where is an area that I can serve? Where is an area that I could use my time, my talents, my treasure to help serve? Now, on a last note, on the back, there is a commitment card. I want you to know, as your leader of this church, that I'm not asking you to sign up for life. I'm not asking you to sign up for life. What I'm asking you to do is sign up for a six-month commitment at a time. We're not going to ask you for a long-term commitment. All we're asking you to do is sign up for six months. Say, I will give the next six months to serve on this team. Now, the serving, your actual role won't start right away. Each of the tables will let you know we're going to have an orientation in about three weeks for most of the ministries where you can come and you can get oriented, find out more about that ministry. Maybe you're not so sure. You're like, I think I might like that, but I'm not really sure. Sign up. Go to the orientation. See what it's all about. Talk to somebody at one of the tables. By the way, there's treats at each table, too, that each ministry has put together. That's just a little lore for you and a little way for us to say thank you this morning for signing up. Lastly, and then we'll close, I promise, I want to ask you as your pastor to help us build this vision, to help us build this mission that we have by committing to at least one of these ministries. Surely there's something you could find here represented where you could commit to. You say, I can do that. Check one of these boxes. Go to the table. Turn it in. The second thing I want to ask you to do, minimally, if you don't feel comfortable committing to one of these ministries to serve in, I'm going to ask you, and, and even for people who are, as your pastor, there, we have two needs. One is simply that you pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for your leadership. Pray for this church. Pray that we would have the impact that God is calling us to, that we would be able to fulfill this mission vision. Surely you can at least do that. Surely you can pray for us as a church. Check that out. Everybody needs to check that one out. The second one I'm going to ask you to do is this. I'm going to ask you to commit to tithe to this church. Tithe to the mission and the vision of this church. It's worth it. It's not, listen, we gave out 20, over 27, 28% of our income. We are not hoarding this money. I'm not getting rich, I can tell you that, okay, <laughs> by being here. That's not the intention. Your money is sowing into the vision and the mission of this church. We have a lot of needs right now. Now, I don't know if you noticed, if you have a bulletin, you can look on your bulletin and you can see we started posting on a monthly basis what our budget is and where we stand as far as how we're meeting that budget. We are under for the year significantly. I want to ask you as your pastor that you would consider, some of you do, you tithe regularly, you tithe above and beyond. And I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. God thanks you. Thank you for serving this church with your treasure. But I want to ask you, if you're not tithing 10% of your income, that you would make a commitment today to do that, to sow into this ministry. You're not giving to us. You're giving to God, and you're giving because he asks you to give in his word. He commands you to give in his word. Now, we have something new that we're starting to make it easier for you to give online and to, to make a monthly commitment. On the bottom here, we have a new online giving application. There's going to be a lot of new things that are going to start rolling out here as a part of our transition in Hope Church. We're in the works. We have a new website. We have a church app that will go on your phone, your smartphone, or your iPad that is close to being developed. This will help you in, an, in a lot of ways be more connected to us. But on the bottom here, online giving, we've changed our online giving portal 
Now you can create reoccurring giving through this application. What that means is if you have a set income and you know you make this much a month and you want to give 10%, you can go in there and create recurring giving to where you can set up automatically. It takes 10% out every month. And it's set up reoccurring. You can set it up once, forget about it. Then you know every month your tithe is coming out. You don't have to remember to bring your checkbook, whatever, all that stuff. I want to ask you to consider that. Consider setting up a reoccurring giving if you know what you're going to make. Okay? Now, I know the hour is getting late, so I want to dismiss you guys. Let me pray for you.